Hello and welcome to Wineskins, a program that features the lives of the saints and reflections on the Sunday readings, along with information on a variety of topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm Father Jim Corda. Our program is brought to you through the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. Our interview segment today will feature Monsignor David Rhodes. We will also get a glimpse into the life and times of St. Anthony of Padua, along with reflections on the readings for this Pentecost Sunday. That and more on Wineskins. To tell us more about social concerns in the Diocese of Youngstown is Nicole Beringer. Catholic Charities kicked off its annual Summer Hunger Campaign on June 1st. This annual effort draws attention to the number of children who qualify for free or reduced breakfast and lunch during the school year, but may not have access to proper nutrition throughout the summer months when school is not in session. According to the statistics provided by the Ohio Department of Education, roughly 52% of students living in our diocese are on a free or reduced lunch program. This percentage is drastically higher in some of our inner cities where poverty rates exceed the state and national averages. The Summer Hunger Campaign aims to alleviate some of the stress that many families face during the summer months. Funds and food items collected throughout this campaign help to provide healthy meal options for school-aged children facing food insecurities during the summer. The Summer Hunger donations help families such as Amy's. Amy's four children are enrolled in the Reduced Lunch Program in their school district. When summer vacation started, Amy had a difficult time ensuring that enough food was in their house to feed her children during the day. Instead of providing a meal at dinner for her four children, Amy must now provide breakfast and lunch. This is an additional 40 meals per week added to Amy's meal budget. Even though she was working, she was unable to stretch the family's budget enough to include the extra meals that were now needed. Amy came to Catholic Charities for help with food. Catholic Charities provided Amy with canned goods and healthy snacks, as well as a food voucher so she could purchase items such as meat, milk, bread, and eggs at a local grocery store. Catholic Charities also provided Amy with links to summer food service programs available in her community. The items Amy received from Catholic Charities were available due to donations received through the Summer Hunger Campaign. Hunger never takes a summer vacation. Food continues to be a pressing need for many families in our diocese, both during the summer and throughout the year. Thousands of families receive food assistance at Catholic Charities each year. Many of these families are working one or more jobs to try and make ends meet, but are still falling short. A box of groceries from Catholic Charities can help a family get through a difficult month. Catholic Charities agencies throughout the diocese offer opportunities for clients to obtain necessary food, to share a meal, and collect information and resources to ensure their most basic nutritional needs are met. Some of these programs include Opening Doors, a parenting program that begins with a family-style meal offered by Catholic Charities of Ashtabula County, Caritas Cafe, A program of Catholic Charities serving Portage and Stark Counties offers a light breakfast for guests. And Catholic Charities Regional Agency offers monthly community meals to engage individuals and families in East Liverpool. These are just some examples of how Catholic Charities is responding to hunger in our diocese. You can get involved in food relief efforts in your community by supporting Catholic Charities' Summer Hunger Campaign. Catholic Charities is collecting monetary donations and food for the Summer Hunger Campaign. A list of suggested food donations can be found on our website. A few of the most desired items are peanut butter, rice, beans, pasta, and pasta sauce. While any donation of food is greatly appreciated, a monetary gift is also an effective way to support the Summer Hunger Campaign. Catholic Charities can use a donation of $20 to provide a family of four with ingredients for healthy meals, along with a few other non-perishable items and snacks. Neighbors and friends may be silently struggling to provide food for their children. Your participation in the Summer Hunger Campaign can make a difference for people in your community looking for help and hope. To learn more about Catholic Charities' Summer Hunger Campaign 
or to make a donation, call 330-744-8451 or visit our website www.ccdoy.org. In the words of Mother Teresa, if you can't feed a hundred people, then just feed one. For Wineskins, I am Nicole Beringer. St. Anthony of Padua was a priest and doctor of the Church. To tell us more is Tom McCarthy. He is from St. Charles Church in Boardman. St. Anthony died near Padua, Italy on June 3, 1231, at the early age of 36, and was canonized on Pentecost the following year by Pope Gregory IX. His cult became widespread immediately after his death, and the Franciscan order had already bestowed on him the title of doctor, although it was not made official until Pope Pius XII proclaimed him the evangelical doctor. Anthony was born in Lisbon, Portugal, and was baptized with the name Ferdinand. At an early age, he attended school with the Augustinians and the Franciscans. When he formally joined the latter, he took the name Anthony as his name in religion. He was ordained to the priesthood in Italy and began preaching ministry that took him through northern Italy and to southern France. Returning to Italy in 1227, he reached his zenith as a preacher at Padua. He was also the first Franciscan to teach theology and was named a lector by St. Francis himself. He died at Padua, where he had been assigned since 1230, and the city gave him a triumphal funeral. He was buried there in the basilica that bears his name. The new opening prayer of the Mass recognizes Anthony as an outstanding preacher that God gave to his people. St. Anthony gave evidence of his preaching skill very early in his priesthood. In the Office of Readings, we have an excerpt from a sermon preached by St. Anthony for the Feast of Pentecost. The man who was filled with the Holy Spirit speaks in different languages. These different languages are different ways of witnessing to Christ, such as humility, poverty, patience, and obedience. We speak in those languages when we reveal in ourselves these virtues to others. Actions speak louder than words. Let your words teach and your actions speak. We are full of words, but empty of actions. In the opening prayer we pray, with the assistance may we follow the gospel of Christ and know the help of your grace in time of need. Popular devotion to St. Anthony as a helper of the oppressed is not fictitious. His name is attached to the law promulgated in Padua in 1231, exempting from imprisonment those who cannot pay their fines or other financial debts. He is rightly invoked as a ready helper in a time of need. To this day, St. Anthony bread is still distributed to the poor by Franciscan friars throughout the world. We are invited to imitate the saint whom St. Francis of Assisi called his bishop. His knowledge of sacred scripture made him competent in theological disputes and a master of persuasion. He has pictured an art with a book signifying his love of scripture, with a flaming heart signifying his deal as a preacher, or holding the infant Jesus in his arms, recalling a visit from the infant during one of his raptures. But for us, the relevance is his fidelity to the gospel, his zeal in dialoguing with those in error, and his loving concern for the poor. Almighty God, you have given St. Anthony to your people as an outstanding preacher and a ready helper in the time of need. With his assistance, may we follow the gospel of Christ and know the help of your grace in every difficulty. For Wineskins, I'm Tom McCarthy. Talking with Father David Rhodes, celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Diocese of Youngstown. You know, in our first segment, we talked a lot about the beginnings really of Catholicism in Ohio and beyond. Let's talk and focus our thoughts now on the beginnings of the diocese here in Youngstown. We talked briefly about the growth of the local church and the creation of the need to create a diocese. 
Let's talk about the early beginnings and our first bishop coming from our mother diocese of Cleveland. Why was that significant? I think it was significant that it gave, my understanding is that creating a new diocese in Youngstown and especially appointing a man like Bishop James McFadden, who was very personable and had a reputation for being very congenial, very affable. It brought the role of the bishop, I think, closer to the people and gave the office of bishop and the presence of the diocese a more personal touch. Mm. One of the excellent sources of that that we have is our former Bishop James Malone, who gave an interview to the Catholic exponent at the time of the 50th anniversary of our diocese. Mm -hmm. Bishop Malone, <clears throat> when he was ordained a priest in 1945, was appointed to the cathedral, would have dinner every day with Bishop McFadden, mm -hmm. got to know him very well, and certainly could reflect a good insight into the kind of bishop that he was. Mm -hmm. And he says, he tells us in that interview how personable he was, how he liked to reminisce. He was present at everything. Prior to that, a diocese like Cleveland was huge, far flung. It would be difficult for a bishop to be present at so many events, whereas Bishop McFadden had this ability to relate nicely to people and to be present to them at ever so many occasions. And that was the gift that I think he brought as I understand it, and the quality that he, mm -hmm. he gave to the new diocese. Let's go on to the Walsh era. Obviously, he came from Charleston, South Carolina, so he was from outside of the state. Right. And what would he have brought, and why would he have come from so far? Well, the word is, he, first of all, he had a very important role in the, what was then the Bishop's Conference of the United States. It was called the Catholic Welfare Conference. Mm -hmm. He played a very important role of leadership in that group. So, and he had been Bishop of Charleston, South Carolina for 22 years. Why that he was chosen, who knows? I mean, you'd have to, we, we don't know that, but he certainly brought experience and the diocese was growing rapidly. It was during his and Bishop McFadden's time, their tenures as Bishop corresponded to the exactly the first 25 years of our diocese. And in that period of 25 years, the population doubled mm. from going from about 150,000 to almost 300,000 people, Catholics. It was practically tremendous growth. And certainly he brought a quality of leadership that enabled him to oversee all that. And of course, you were very close with Bishop Malone. You worked very closely with him in the chancery. Yeah. Let's talk about some of those recollections that you have of Bishop Malone. Well, I worked there for 10 years in the 70s from 1969 to 79. It was exciting years because the Vatican Council had just, Second Vatican Council had just ended in 1965, right after I was ordained. Bishop Malone was one of the youngest bishops at that council. Mm -hmm. He attended all the sessions. Right after that council ended, in January of 1966, he was appointed apostolic administrator of the diocese because of Bishop Walsh's illness. And he was in charge of seeing to the implementation of Vatican II. Mm -hmm. My greatest memory of Bishop Malone was the competency with which he did that. He was intelligent, bright leader, he could be difficult to work with, but the other side of the coin was that he was, you learned a lot from him. Mm -hmm. And so I have great memories of the experience I had. It so happened that Bishop Malone during those years was chairman of the Bishop's Committee on the Liturgy. Mm -hmm. And that was the area that the church was changing mostly in the 70s. Mm -hmm. The liturgy, introduction of the new order of mass and all the reform of the sacraments. Bishop Malone was chairman of that bishop's committee overseeing that, mm -hmm. and I had the responsibility, serving in the chancery with him, of implementing the introduction of those rites, the study days for priests, presentation of issues to the people through homilies and so on. Mm -hmm. It was a very exciting time, yeah. and uh, I have great memories of those days. How have you seen the diocese grow, but also change? in the years that you've been part of the diocese? 
I think you can divide our 75 years into three 25-year segments very conveniently, both in terms of the tenures of the bishops, mm -hmm. Bishop Walsh and McFadden, first 25 years, Bishop Malone's tenure as bishop corresponds almost exactly to the next 25 years, uh, from 1968 to 1995. And during that period, it wasn't the growth of numbers in terms of Catholic schools, institutions, parishes. It was more the growth of reform of the church through the documents of Vatican II. Mm -hmm. Extraordinary things, particularly involvement of the lay people, involvement of the baptized in the, in the work of the church and ministry of the church. That was the big thing for the second period. The last 25 years, of course, has been difficult in that we've had two fine bishops in Bishop Tobin and Bishop Murray. They've had to deal with the declining population, the decline in numbers of vocations mm -hmm. to priesthood and religious life. So we've had to address a new kind of church, more like what uh, Bishop Fenwick faced in the, in the very early days, a shortage of priests and challenges that he faced. For more information on that topic and other related issues, and to listen to Wineskins, visit the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown at www.doy.org. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hello, I am Bishop George Murray. Last year, over 17,000 Catholic households supported the work of our church family. Please join us in our efforts to have 100% participation in our annual Bishop's Appeal this year. How exactly can you help us meet that goal? You can do that with your daily prayers for the success of our appeal efforts, or by donating through your parish towards the $4.2 million goal which makes our ministries possible in the Diocese of Youngstown, or by your spirit of volunteerism in your local parish and community. Won't you please join us in this annual appeal effort in faith, hope, and charity. St. Angela Marici founded the Ursuline Sisters in 1535 the fulfillment of God's plan for her to found a company of consecrated virgins who would one day establish schools, orphanages, and dispensaries throughout the world. In the rule of St. Angela, dictated by St. Angela herself, we discover her great love for and reliance on the Eucharist. St. Angela writes, for in the Holy Mass are to be found afresh all the merits of the Passion of our Lord, and the greater the attention, faith, and contrition one brings to it, the deeper is one's participation in these blessed merits, and the greater the consolation one receives. Indeed, this will be a communion in spirit. The Ursuline Sisters have served in the Youngstown Diocese since 1874, particularly in the field of Catholic education. 33 million Americans have descended into poverty. And as their futures fall, so does our nations. Our song today is from the CD entitled, In His Presence. It is by the Kellenberg Memorial High School Choir.
Our scripture reflections for this Pentecost Sunday will be done by Deacon Mike Kajancic. He is from St. Charles Church in Boardman. Growing up, I was taught to pray Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. In 1965, that changed to Holy Spirit. No reason was given for this. At that time, we were simply to pray, pay, and obey, and just do it. Some accepted the change. Others thought the world was ending. And still for some, it was no big deal. But if we examine this closely, it truly is a big deal, more than just a more accurate translation. I looked up the meaning of the word spirit in the dictionary, and it comes from a Latin word meaning breath. And the dictionary has ten meanings for spirit. Number three was a supernatural being such as a ghost or angel. Number ten was distilled alcohol. But the remaining eight definitions were words that were very much alive, talked about mood, thought, loyalty, life principle, quality, and so on. The eight meanings were not things that are supposed or disembodied, but they talked of vitality, of energy, of life. In the Gospel we read, He breathed on them. The same word is used for God breathing His Spirit or His life on Adam. That set Adam apart from the others, and it sets us apart. This breath is not a disembodied spirit of a dead God, but a very life principle of our divine living Abba. Then he says, receive the Holy Spirit. That same mission, mandate, and power given by the Holy Spirit through Jesus is now given to us followers as well. Pentecost is celebrated as the birthday of the church. It was within an assembled community of faith while in prayer that this gift was given. He is still present when the faithful gather in prayer. God breathed new life into the world, and that gift of the Holy Spirit was present and promised to all who gather. The problem is, what do we do when we receive the gift? Do we put it on a shelf, something to be admired, or do we use it? It's a beautiful gift, this breath of God. It contains the life principles of wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety or holiness, and wonder and awe of God. All of that is alive, and like any good gift, it's meant to be used. Pentecost, the 50th day, is about life. It's about realizing that we are to receive, use, and share this breath of God that we have been given. We live the mission to preach Jesus and his revelation of the Father. The Holy Spirit makes it possible. To believe is to be a person of faith. To be a person of faith is to be truly alive. For Wineskins, I'm Deacon Mike Kajensik. The people of Pentecost were filled with the Holy Spirit in fire. They had a profound experience of God through the Holy Spirit. And the real miracle of Pentecost was the togetherness of all God's people. Wineskins is made possible by the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. Wineskins is produced by CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. I'm Father Jim Corda, thanking you for being with us. Have a blessed Sunday, and may God be with you. And congratulations to the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown, who today officially closes the 75th anniversary celebration with a special Mass from St. Columba Cathedral today. have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. What have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. They say America is the land of opportunity, but for some, life isn't so easy. Right now in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. That's nearly 13 million children of all races all across our country. Where do you draw the line and get involved? You can make a difference in more ways than you think. Go to PovertyUSA.org today, because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development.